Uh, we're very fortunate to have Ricky Saltzman with us today. Um, she has been with the, the Folk Life Coordinator for the Iowa Arts Council for about 15, 20 years. And um, she's going to discuss some connections between ethnic identity and folklore. Folklore includes the traditions, language, art, food, and various customs of people. Uh, she's going to make connections between the old and new, tradition and novelty. Um, in her function with the Iowa Arts Council, uh, Ricky works with a variety of communities and individuals to help with multicultural and diversity issues, project planning, event planning, presentation of traditional arts and artists, and grant writing. We could use some of that here, too. Um, she is uh, working on Iowa Folk Life, an online multicultural folk life curriculum and a companion to Iowa Folk Life. Uh, this is Iowa Folk Life 2. Um, she has worked with uh, Iowa Public Radio, producing Iowa Roots. Is that right? Uh, it's a radio series and a website that explores cultures and traditions. So she's concerned with immigrant experience in Iowa, uh, successes as well as struggles and difficulties. I think she's perfectly situated for us uh, to discuss what it's like to be um, somebody from abroad living in Iowa and the challenges that face, that those people face, as well as the opportunities. Um, I don't think it was that long ago when our grandparents or great-grandparents came to America always looking for a better country, a better place, more opportunity. So I don't know that the people these days are that different in terms of their aspirations and hopes. So without further ado, Ricky Saltzman. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, bear with me on the technology. Um, I avoid PowerPoint at all costs. And um, I'm showing a bunch of websites. And I'm going to do a little show and tell in a minute. So you know, keep your fingers crossed that the techno gods and goddesses do what they're supposed to do and that I push the right buttons. So OK. Um, let me start, and then I'm going to switch to the show and tell part. And the title of this is Iowa Traditions in Transition, Negotiating Identity, Performing Folklore. Identity, particularly ethnic identity, is not static, but a process that is negotiated in performance in the ways that people live their lives and interact with others. A group's folklore, the constellation of traditions, the beliefs, observances, verbal and visual art, food ways, music, dance, and displays that are both rooted in and create a group's identity inevitably change and adapt over time and space. If it's not changing, it's dead, and it's not folklore anymore. Whether situated in the home country or a new one, how a group maintains its folklore always involves negotiation between old and new, tradition and innovation, strict adherence to a group's past, and unique contributions of creative individuals. OK, I'm going to go off the mic, so if you can't hear me, move up. OK, I want to do Iowa for the next one. OK, sorry. OK, sorry so much for going off the mic. Um, anyway, it's teeny tiny stitches. It's not done with a pattern. Women learn how to do this as girls. Obviously, some are better than others. And um, you know, this is, this is what adorns the clothes. It also adorns parts of story cloths, the pandao that you'll see Hmong women selling. Um, that's they've just morphed into quilts, eyeglass covers, whatever. So let me pass this around. Okay. And finally, I, I mentioned my daughter. My daughter is from Cambodia. And so um, I got her when she was six months. And um, we went back a year and a half ago to visit. And so I brought the elephant. This is now a keychain, but it's using traditional fabric. So you can see how things change. And this is a traditional scarf called a krama. And you can wear, OK, you know, when you, you know when you take a shower and you put the towel over your head? That's more or less how a krama is worn. It also can be tied to hold a baby. It can be used to pad your shoulders, to hold wood, whatever. Anyway, I, I grabbed a bunch of that stuff this morning. I was thinking about it last night because I, I thought, as long as I'm talking about ethnicity and identity, I should at least share mine with you. So on the census, which is coming up again, um, what I need to say, what we say for our family, is that we are an Asian American family because my daughter is from Cambodia. Um, my husband is 
his mother was Jewish, his father was not. By Jewish law, he is not half Jewish. He's Jewish, but he didn't grow up that way, so what is he? Okay, so anyway, that's just, just some things for you to think about. So we'll get back to the more formal stuff. Okay, so to be a bit more specific about the definition of what is variously called folklore, folk life, or folk and traditional art, sometimes expressive culture, um, folklorists are adept at, noth at nothing else at coming up with new names for what it is we study. These are practices that have a community base and express that community's aesthetics and heritage. They encompass the everyday knowledge, art, and lore that are passed from one member of the community to another through imitation, observation, or word of mouth. The skills and traditions are learned, usually learned informally rather than through academic means, but not always. Most traditional arts have endured through several generations, and typical communities include ethnic, tribal, occupational, regional, or religious groups. So I'm sure you all have your cyclone folklore about the Hawkeyes, I bet. Okay. Um, folk and traditional artists are individuals from a particular group who produce, pass on, and preserve living folk and traditional art forms that reflect the identity of that group. For example, Meskwathi dancers, Lao weavers, Mennonite quilters, Irish bagpipers, as well as Western Iowa quilting groups, Amana artisans. Okay, you get the idea. I'm going to repeat, if you've been, how many of you have been to these talks before from the beginning? Are there a group of you? No, okay, good, you don't know this yet. <clears throat> All right, Iowa today bears witness to the population and consequent cultural shifts that happen periodically in the United States. In 1870, the Iowa Board of Immigration, isn't that great, there was an Iowa Board of Immigration in 1870, published Iowa, A Home for Immigrants, a booklet that issued an invitation to folks in the eastern United States and throughout Europe to settle in Iowa, which they did. And Scandinavians and Dutch arrived, joining the Meskwaki, as well as German, French, and other early non-native settlers. The 20th century, with its global wars, brought further waves of immigration to Iowa. Mexicans and Italians came to work on the railroads. There were Mexicans in Iowa over 100 years ago. They didn't just come. Okay. Um, Italians, Croats, and African Americans went into the coal mines. Jews, Greeks, and Lebanese opened small shops. After American involvement in the war in Southeast Asia ended in 1975, newcomers from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia arrived, thanks to Governor Ray's compassionate and far-sighted refugee resettlement initiative. The 1980s and 90s brought Russian Jews, um, Bosnians, New Air from the Sudan, Somali, and Iraqis. And the current decade has seen Burmese, Afghanis, more Iraqis, as well as immigrants from Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama, Colombia, Nicaragua, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. And I'm sure there are plenty I'm not mentioning. Within the past 10 years, Latinos have become the largest minority group in the state, with African Americans a close second. In the 21st century, Iowa has continued to welcome immigrants, some political refugees from war-torn lands and others unofficial economic refugees looking, as did most of our ancestors, for safe and better lives for themselves and their children. So all over the state, my job has been to document traditional artists um, from all of these places and the ones um, who've, whose families have been here for, for generations. And I think for me what this research does is, is that it certainly reveals the many ways that newcomers try to hold on to certain parts of their heritage, um, but they're also forced to leave other parts behind. And precious customs and keepsakes become both painful and treasured memories as newcomers must adapt to new environments, combine their traditions with new ones, and somehow make the transition to becoming Americans. And they all somehow manage to do it. So in this country, though, we're so accustomed to cross-cultural combinations that we frequently don't recognize the original influences of foods, music, dance, art, and craft traditions that we now take for granted. Pizza, bagels, tacos, and egg rolls have become American foods. In Iowa, we regard pork tenderloin and fresh-picked corn as somehow unique to our state, despite the fact that breaded pork tenderloin has its roots in traditional Czech cooking, and it's also popular in Illinois and Indiana, I states, by the way, and for folklore terminology. Um, well, just about every state in the U.S. grows corn, and Delaware corn is the best. Just to be clear about that. We think of blues, jazz, rock and roll, rap, and hip hop as American music. And what could be more American than Christmas trees, which originated in Germany, or Fourth of July fireworks, which originated in China? While not one of these cultural icons is without its roots in cultures from other places, what makes our country unique are the ways in which the heritage of so many peoples come together in so many ways. While we come together, however, it's not as a melting pot, a tossed salad, or whatever other food metaphor comes to mind. 
Cultures do blend, but they also remain distinct, and individuals and groups from a particular culture pick and choose which parts to display for themselves, their families, their larger group, and for outsiders. And sometimes they have it imposed on them. And all of us learn to do this. We pick and choose from a range of cultural signifiers, depending on setting, context, audience, and an underlying notion of what constitutes aesthetic competence, which means how you are, who you are. While there's rules and expectations for all these factors, any one of them, as well as the rules and expectations themselves, can and do change in different environments. Yet an aesthetically proficient performance of identity depends upon both performer and audience sharing the same understanding of these rules. I didn't know I had to need to stay behind the microphone. Okay, I've got to do it right. And that's not always possible for refugees and immigrants abruptly moved from one place to another. The very fabric of everyday expectations has been shredded, and people who are more than competent in their own culture suddenly have to figure out the very basics of survival, how to find food, how to cook it with unfamiliar tools, how to cross a street, how to get to a doctor, or how to dress for winter when all you've ever known is summer. What I'd like to do at this point is talk about the Amana colonies as an example of how a group has negotiated. Let's see if it works. Um, how a group has negotiated its identity over the years and survived due to some strategic types of performance. I tend to think of the Amana colonies in concentric rings, with the outermost for the most general of publics and the innermost for insiders and those who've married in um, exclusively. So what follows includes information found on their various websites. Okay, so this is the basic Amana website, and they tell you right away, this is how they present themselves. It's a story unlike any other in American history. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. What we now know as the Amana colonies in eastern Iowa began in the, eight, in the 18th century Germanic states with a pietistic group. And note that the, it wasn't Germany, okay? It wasn't Germany yet. It was Germanic states, okay? They presented as Germany. It's easier that way, all right? But it, makes, it does make a difference. Like the 17th century English Quakers and in protest against the rituals and intellectualism of the Lutheran church, they believed that God could inspire individuals to speak. So let's hear Carolyn Trumphold. Let's see if we get this to work. Um, hang on a second. Okay. I want you to hear Carolyn Trumphold, um, who's a traditional manner quilter and cook, talk about her community and her church. Now, this is from Iowa Roots. It's the website part of Iowa Roots. Let's see if the MP3 really downloads. Maybe not. So I'm going to skip over, once the little thingy comes up, the intro stuff, because you don't need to hear that, but it may not come up. Oh, darn. OK, well, there it is. OK. Is that, can you hear this? <laughs> I thought we were going to have. Totally religious based until 1932. Living here has given us such a right, hang on. that I think there's no. I'm sorry, I like so can't see. Thank you. That's all right. uh, oh, that guy. Okay. Uh, shoot, yeah, grab it. You got to grab it. it up. Okay, there, there you, you go. go. All right. Thank you. Okay. we would ever be comfortable in any other part that? of the country okay. living there permanently. It's a very comfortable, close community to live in. Our church is very important to us personally. I can't say that it's important to everyone who is here, but we have always been members of this church, and uh, my husband and I still go to the German service which is the first service every Sunday, and then there's an English service that follows. Uh, the name of the church is uh, the Amana Church Society now. It, uh, it began as the Community of True Inspiration in Germany in 1714. And when the, when the community reorganized in 1932, it, uh, separating the business part from the church part, that's when the church name changed to 
the business part was called the Amana Society and the other was the Amana Church Society. The change happened for various reasons. Um, there were some economic setbacks, such as in 1922. Okay, I'm gonna just stop that at this point. You can listen to it. Just Google Iowa Roots and Caroline Trumphold. Um, All right, so if you visit the Amana colonies today, um, you'll find that there's ways, that there, there's a lot of ways to do so, with each preserving a different aspect of the group's collective identity. You can stop at the I-80 Visitor Center south of the freeway and see what is known as Little Amana, which is not any part of the original seven villages, but pretty much a commercial stop. And this is Amana, okay? And you can see the seven villages, and if you scroll down, in fact, I lose my website, sorry. All right, well, believe me, it's, it's down here. It's on, the, it's on the south side of 80. Um, and you can eat at one of the two restaurants, and you can be served food. It is German influence, but not at all a man of traditional food, because people want German food. They really don't care at that stage whether it's in fact a manna food, or at least that's what the restaurateurs have decided. You can buy wine and purchase crafts, food items, and ubiquitous souvenirs, some of which are not made in the Amana colonies, but you, aren't lear you won't learn much about the Amanas. You can venture further into the culture by taking Route 151 North, that's right here, um, and follow the signs to Maine Amana, and there you'll find more restaurants, several wine shops, a bakery, galleries, and more. If you want to get beyond the tourist experience, visit the Ameri Amana Heritage Society Museum. Okay, and this takes you through a detailed history of the colonies, which explores the religious beliefs, the handcrafts, the foodways, the clothing, the social structure, home design, and more. But it's not dead yet. When I first came here, you know, this is one of the groups I studied in American history. It's one of those millenarian movements in the United States. Right, they must have gone the way of the Oneidas and the others. Um, they didn't, um, <laughs> they're still alive. Um, but, you, but you wouldn't know it at this point. And, and at this point in your visit, you still haven't met any real people. So you might go to the Broom and Basket Shop. And if you're lucky, you'll meet the owner, Joanna Schantz, who apprenticed in 1977 with Philip Dickel to learn the art of willow basket making and the cultivation of willow patches. Dickel was the last active basket maker who learned his craft from before the change in 1932. And that was, Caroline referred to that in her interview. The change happened when it went from being basically a communal society where everybody owned everything together and in common, everybody's needs were provided for, can you say communism? It was. Um, and it wasn't working. Like a lot of millenarian groups, it stopped working for a number of reasons. But in any case, the religious core remained. And there was a distinct the change. And they will still talk about the change that happened in 1932. And anybody who was born between, before 32 has a faint German accent, which, which is kind of cool. And the church services, there's still church services in German. So um, anyway. So there were, there's a number of kinds of baskets. There are laundry baskets, sewing baskets, garden baskets, ba and baskets in which to carry meals home from the community kitchens if someone was ill. And I love that they have the function that's specified for baskets. So this is Joe Shantz. And you can see, if I don't mouse this up, one of her baskets. They're just some of the most beautiful baskets I've ever seen. They have removable bottoms, which means when your basket falls apart or if your bottom falls apart, you can still keep it going. Okay, so um, let's see if we can try this again. And I want you to hear her talk about just a little of her experience with Philip Dickel and learning. Iowa roots. People yeah, sorry about that. Cultural traditions. When, when I became part of this community, it was like back in the 60s. Can you hear? I lived upstairs with my husband and our children upstairs apartment downstairs was his grandparents the wing of the house was his parents i kept hearing the word outsider but because i married in a man and boy i wasn't really considered an outsider but his grandparents used the word outsider a lot his parents didn't now i rarely hear the word outsiders my name is joanna Shantz. i was born and raised in cedar rapids iowa 
I met my husband in the 60s. We got married and he brought me down into the Amana colonies to live in what became a four generation house. We opened a broom and basket shop in West Amana. We had the broom machine that Philip Grease had made brooms on. So we learned how to make brooms. I wanted to know, inf I wanted information on basket weaving. So they, other people in the community uh, told me to go see Philip Dickel in Middle Amana. I went to see Philip Dickel. I asked him to tell me about basket weaving so that I could put the information in the shop. And he said, I'll show you. So then he came to the shop. We planted willows together. He showed me how to plant the willows. About three years later, we cut the willows together. He showed me how to sort the willows. He sat down and wove a basket. Then Philip sat me down and watched while I wove a basket and he corrected me and guided me in making my very first basket. Before 1932, there were basket shops in each village. It was something that was traditionally done. There were baskets all over. Okay, so you get the idea with that. And in the Amana colonies, the crafts are critical to who they are. It's, um, so for them, that's a cultural signifier. So, okay, you've met Joanna. You like her baskets, maybe you've bought one. Um, so you might wanna go to the Amana Arts Guild in High Amana. And High Amana, if you remember that diagram is kinda to the northwest. Um, and there you'll learn about traditional quilts, tin work, knitting, and more. And you can check out the traveling trunk. Yes, okay, they have a traveling trunk. I love this. This is, again, how they teach their kids, but also our kids, um, what it's like to be a manna um, and from the colonies. So there's the quilts. They're whole cloth quilts. They're not patchwork. Um, they used to have a wool interior. They were really warm. Well, if you're from central Germany and you move to Buffalo, New York, and then you come to Iowa, pretty much you want to stay warm. Um, but the patterns... Are, and the, and the, uh, the quilting are what identify Amana quilts um, as Amana quilts. And um, you'll see some of the patterns in some of the tin work as well. Anyway, um, so this shows, uh, the, the trunk shows what Amana residents want others to know of their folk crafts and history and what they teach their children about their heritage. To more personally experience the culture, you could get a reservation in early, I just got mine, for the communal meal. Um, Arts Guild members create, recreate a homemade traditional meal served communal style every November. It's, I'm trying to remember now if it's with candlelight or gas lights, I can't remember. Um, but you'll taste the Amana cocktail, which, and don't laugh, it's not bad, a combination of dry and sweet rhubarb wine. Um, you can enjoy applesauce from local heirloom summer apples and perhaps have a dish made with Ebenezer onions, another heirloom variety the colonists carried with them from Buffalo. And you'll get to rub elbows with local folks whose roots go back to the first true inspirationists. Even at this stage, however, the community's core is still highly protected from outsiders. And you won't get a chance to witness that unless you have a man of friends. And if you do, take the opportunity to spend the night, because somebody will ask you, admire the hand-loomed, colorfully striped rugs that adorn rooms sized to fit the rugs rather than the reverse. The looms were a certain size. The rooms in every house are a certain size to fit the rugs, not the reverse. Um, and you can enjoy a filling breakfast of, of eggs scrambled with soaked stale bread, toast with homemade strawberry jam, and coffee. There's always coffee. But I think that may be more Iowa than anything else. Um, and you can accept an invitation, you might also accept an invitation to attend church where women sit on one side of the plain wooden sanctuary, men on the other, and all sing together without instrumental accompaniment. Short of being born into or marrying into the community, this is about as involved as an outsider can get. We're well past negotiating ethnicity. Folklore is not performed, but lived and shared, an inseparable part of everyday life. The Amana colonies are an easy example of a long-lived community that displays its folk life for others and itself with increasing depth and meaning. Yet there's many communities across Iowa that also have specific themes or iconic events, food, music, or crafts. If I mention Pella or Orange City, what do you think of? Dutch, yes, okay. What do they have every spring? Tulips, yes, they have a tulip festival. It's tulip time in Pella. It's every May. Even if it's a late spring or an early spring or there's been a frost at the wrong time or whatever, there's still tulips. 
And you can bet global warming is messing with, <laughs> with the tulips and when they come up. So anyway, these are Dutch Lutheran reformed towns that celebrate their Dutchness in very specific ways through tulips, lots of imported Dutch souvenirs, local historical societies, restaurants, bakeries, and the all important festivals. In Pella, let's see if I can do this right. Ah, I did it, right. Um, the tulip festival, sorry. I'm just going to scroll down to this because there's, sorry, there's always, all right, you get the idea. There's the kid in the Dutch hat. Um, uh, okay. It includes street, street scrubbers, a street cleaning ritual by girls in 19th century outfits, Dutch dancers, a Volkes parade, Volks, Volks, Volkswagen, okay, and lots of Dutch letters. These are, if you don't, does anybody not know what a Dutch letter is? Ah, okay, you're not an Iowan yet. You will be, though. Buff, the Badesh letters are puff pastries in the shape of a letter S filled with almond paste. You used to, until a couple years ago, only be able to get them in Pella, Iowa. They've apparently migrated to Ames. Um, but it's, it's the actual, the letter, their Christmas cookie in Holland, and it's a, a pretty much of a standard European puff pastry filled with almond paste. Almond paste, by the way, comes from the Middle East. Um, that's a whole other matter. But Scandinavian countries have adopted it with a vengeance. And so Dutch letters in Iowa mean Dutch, mean Pella. Um, the straight ones called banquettes, the sticks, you can get those in Orange City. OK. So you can buy Dutch letters. You can um, have dried beef, which is like corned beef sandwiches. Um, and those in the know will buy locally made, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, sausages, which is basically sausages wrapped in puff pastry, pigs in a blanket. And most cultures have these, but these are special Dutch ones. As well as Stroop waffles. And this is a thin waffle cookie sandwich filled with caramelized syrup. And if you haven't had them, if you see them on a shelf somewhere, grab them. They're wonderful. Um, now, traditionally, they're made with lard. So if you are, are Muslim or observant Jewish, sorry, you're out of luck. But I think the commercial variety isn't using lard. So check it out. Look, read the ingredients. But this festival, OK, it's been this Dutch thing. But it now includes a quilt show, an art exhibition, tours of historic sites and museums, a 5K run, and now a tractor rodeo. I think that's a recent addition. The event concludes with a thanksgiving and praise service. This is a religious community, and such a concluding frame signifies that. But it also features the event, Central College's steel pan ensemble, and the Nadas, showing visitors that Pella is more than just Dutch. But you'd never know this from the way, where are we now? Um, that the town, there we go, that the town um, presents itself. You have to dig deeper and hang out there to see beyond the tulips. The same applies to Orange City. And Orange City has a tulip festival. Um, and that includes, and I'm quoting from their website, music and dancing by hundreds of children and adults in intricate, authentic costumes, two daily parades featuring top area marching bands, nightly musical theater, a carnival midway, fun ethnic food treats, plus thousands of tulips and a dozen reproduction windmills throughout a charming village. Okay, the focus is on the past, you know, loud and clear. But their festival also includes performances by a group called the Dutch Dozen, and they dance. Um, I'm not sure if their dances bear any resemblance to anything going on in Holland these days, but really, does it matter? You know? um, and it theirs also concludes with a worship service, again, emphasizing the spiritual as well as the ethnic roots of these towns. Note also that Pella and Orange City, and you, I'm not going to show you this, but take my word for it, use language to signify ethnicity as well and publish information in Dutch, just as the Amana colonies do in German. So again, they're loud and clear saying, this is who we are, this is where our roots are. Now, besides these events that celebrate their heritage and their towns, both cities have residents who are very clear about their heritage. Orange City's Joyce Blumendahl does Dutch Hindelupen, which is a decorative painting style. And I'm going to try to scroll down and not lose the website. OK, there you go. Um, it's a decorative painting style similar to Norwegian rose modeling, um, used to adorn furniture and dishes. A good friend of mine who is Norwegian told me that the Norwegian attitude towards this is leave no, un no surface unpainted. Um, and the, the Dutch are not far behind. There's no mistaking how Joyce performs her heritage. 
Loretta Hegeman and Elaine Kane, sisters raised in a Dutch American family and community, preserve, they're also from Orange City, and they preserve their ethnicity with recipes that include homemade stroopwafels and the sausage brochies. Um, family food recipes are passed from mother to daughter, and preparing them becomes sorry, a family affair. Okay, and this is the recipe. And this is on the first Iowa Folklife curriculum, if you would like the recipe. Um, so family, as well as ethnicity, is key for them. Both Elaine and Loretta are expert cooks and make the family recipes just as their predecessors did. But they, and the instructions are in this, they use a Norwegian krumkaka iron to make the stroopwafels, which I love. It's what they had. The Norwegians were around. They had the right equipment. Um, and this is yet another indicator of how fluid ethnic identity can be. And basically, a, a krumkaka iron, or think of a waffle iron, the old-fashioned kind without two distinct ridges, so we're not talking about a Belgian waffle, but really, you know, like ice cream cone kind of waffle um, impressions. But if it doesn't have the impressions, it's not right. It's not the right kind of cookie. So by now you have the idea about Iowa's towns and inhabit how they Iowa's towns and inhabitants represent themselves. Decorah and the Vesterheim have their Nordic festival, Nordic fest, which includes not only Norwegian dance, food, music, and worship services, but also the ubiquitous arts festival, a children's petting zoo, and performances by the celebration Iowa Singers and Jazz Band, a group change, trained by Luther College. And these are uh, high school kids who have usually been in their, their high school show choirs. And they try out, and it, they're a good group. Um, Elkhorn and Kimbleton to the west. Decor is in the northeast. Elkhorn and Kimbleton are the midwest of Iowa, the west. Um, are Danish settlements, uh, towns in western Iowa that have more Danes per capita than anywhere else outside of Denmark. Iowa, um, I noticed when I first got here, was very big on firsts and having more uh, doing everything more than anybody else. And I tr attributed this to what I dubbed the middle child syndrome. I'm an oldest. I don't have this problem. Um, <laughs> anyway, they have to prove it. All right. Um, there's a Danish windmill. Um, the Danish Immigrant Museum, Eula Fest in the winter, and Tivoli Fest in the summer. And if you stop into various stores in town, you'll notice the obvious Danish-themed items as well as the more subtle traditional foods in the convenience store. So you have to look for it. The more subtle stuff you really do have to hunt for. Moving past the towns, look, look at two non-Western European communities that celebrate their heritage in both public and private ways, the Thai Dom and the Meskwaki. And I'm going to start with the Meskwaki. OK. The casino includes some surface level Indian decor, as well as an extensive exhibit area in the hotel lobby. The, the website actually doesn't show you that. Um, but they do have a tab on Meskwaki history. Uh, let's see. Okay, I, you can do the tab or you can just do what I just did. Um, and that tells you the history. And starting interestingly with the language, they're woodland Indi Indians, their language is Algonquin. Um, and this further points everybody to the Meskwaki Tribal website, which you will hear in a minute. Give it a chance. So notice the traditional singing that's about to come on. <laughs> when you click on the Meskwaki Settlement site, it'll come on in a minute. There we go. Can you hear that? OK. All right. I'm going to turn the sound down on that one. All right. All right. So this is, um, as I said, um, Iowa's oldest group. And let me move to this. OK. Um, they have a public powwow every year in August, a harvest celebration that has its roots in the Green Corn Festival. And this, this kind of covers all American Indians. They all have a Green Corn Festival of one sort or another. This is a communal time, as Mary McBee, mother of Suzanne Wanity, a uh, uh, Tama Meskwaki settlement resident, resident, puts it. It's always such a treat, working out there around the fire under the big trees, big old kettles boiling while we scrape kernels off the blanched ears, talking together, kids playing, relatives coming and going, helping or not. The powwow itself, and this is the folk life curriculum, the second one, and we did a whole unit on, on the powwow. Um, the powwow itself, however, is more about displaying traditional dance, drum, song, food, and some history for visitors. But it's also one of the ways that children learn to be Meskwaki. 
but also note the Meskwaki's claim to a broader American identity. And this is the flag song, which I'll play you a little bit of. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I always turn the sound up. Can you hear that? Okay, that goes on. Um, so if, if I keep it on, we're going to be here forever because I could do this forever and you would leave. Um, <laughs> anyway, the flag song performed at every powwow clearly marks that identity as not just Meskwaki and not just American, but both. And a big deal is the presenting of the colors and the veterans. American Indians and Meskwaki in particular, who there are code talkers who are Meskwaki. Um, if you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, anyway, they volunteer... Uh, to be soldiers in, I think, higher uh, percentage than any, for capita than any other group in the United States, which continues to amaze me. Um, besides the powwow, there are the public powwow. There are also ones at other times of years that are just from Meskwaki. Um, the settlement has a cultural center, which isn't working. Okay, let's go. Hang on. Sorry, I've lost my place. Let's see if we go that way. There we go. Okay, it's got a cultural center um, with lots more information about um, their historic preservation work. Um, and there's also various drum and dance groups, language and cultural classes at the local school, and a variety of ways to transmit specific cultural traditions and values. So Suzanne Wanity, whose mother, Mary McBee, you heard a little earlier, and her mother's white, and Suzanne's father is Indian. Um, so she counts in Meskwaki world as Meskwaki. Um, her partner, Jonathan Buffalo, by current Meskwaki rules, doesn't count, even though he looks more Indian than Suzanne does. It, it's, it's a complex situation of defining ethnicity. But Suzanne talks about how the Meskwaki claim their identity in their own way, in a way that doesn't necessarily accord with white ways of thinking, doing, or being. So let me play a little bit with what she talks about. Let's see if we get past that. Welcome to Isle of Saltzman. Folk life. One of the great things about maple syrup is that you, around here, even if you don't know how to make it, um, you feel, still find that you need it. It's not necessary that everybody knows how to make it, as long as you treat the people well who do know how to make it. My name is Dawn Suzanne Wanity. I was born in Iowa City, Iowa, and I live on the Meskwaki Indian Settlement. I think it was a couple years ago, we were in Iowa City at a powwow. But while we were there, someone came up and said that they were concerned about the tribe. And um, we thanked them, but then we asked, what is it that they were concerned about? And they said, because we were losing our culture. When I asked them to explain further, they said it was their understanding that the last family who made maple syrup on the settlement had stopped. It's not how I saw it. I, I let them know that they, we actually have quite a few people in the settlement who make syrup. I pointed out that we're a tribe, and in a tribe, you, everybody's got different strengths, and everybody's got different qualities and knowledge that they bring at different times in their life. We still have that knowledge. Plus, we still, it was beyond the knowing how to making it, it was the valuing of that process, and that we still regarded that process Okay, so she goes on to talk about um, being Meskwaki and in ways that are different than white people wanted to tell her she needed to be Meskwaki. Um, and so it, it was kind of a, it was an interesting interview. And uh, whenever I show up there, she tells me more things um, that I don't generally write down. So, um, okay, Everett Capeyu is a tribal elder who passed away a couple of years ago. And he talks about being Meskwaki in some ways that are a little bit different than Suzanne's. Everett is kind of, was in your face, um, flirted 
a lot. Loved, loved redheads and uh, had quite a wicked sense of humor. for the government and for my people. My name was given to me when I was born. You pronounce it Ogatapia. There are ceremonies for everything that the Indian does. The Indian, when he is born or she is born, they have a ceremony for giving a little baby a name. And like during the summer, when you plant and when some grows, then you have a ceremony before you partake of what you grow. You don't partake of it before. The songs I sing are called mood songs, M-O-O-D-S. If you're sitting here and if you, you see a person that's feeling bad, you can sing him a song to kind of make him feel better. The mood sound or whatever mood a person you see is feeling like. As a matter of fact, about three nights ago, I was sitting outside by myself, was singing these songs, you know, and my wife was inside watching TV. I was singing through the woods and the birds and whatever. I am from Tim, Iowa. Originally, the tribe came from the East Coast. But with the pilgrims coming in, we were moved gradually up this way, and then we ended up in Iowa. Notice he calls and white I people pilgrims. In 1857, the landowners of the land was the Muskokis because they bought it with their own money. The other Indians across the country, they are living on government land called reservations. I always say, the reservations are like zoos, Z-O-O, -O, zoos, where you keep monkeys and gorillas and all that. The government owns that land, and to me, they can chase the Indians out whenever they please. Whereas on our land, we call it the settlement, and we don't want anybody saying that's a reservation. But now, the government, with its system, is turning the land into a reservation. See, back home, I'm kind of like a jokester. I'm humorous. But when I turn serious, I'm considered a radical. The original system was the hereditary chief with his people together. Everybody had a say-so with their clans. Now it's split up. That's a problem with my people. Okay. Um, when we did this interview, it was at the time when um, the cas there was quite an uproar about the casinos. So I don't know if you, anybody remembers that, um, but it, that's what he's referring to about the government coming in and imposing stuff. Okay, so I want to move to the Southeast Asian refugees at this point. Ah, great. Um, and they started coming to Iowa in late 1975 after the fall of Saigon. So let's start with the Thai Dom. Now their story appears on the Bureau of Refugee Services website, and this is the history of the Bureau, as part of the Bureau's founding story, and it was indeed part of their founding story, um, as well as on the Thai Villages site. Okay. Um, the Thai Dom belonged to themselves, and they belonged to Iowa. They're part of Iowa's story that we as Iowans tell ourselves about ourselves as good and generous people who welcome refugees. The Thai Dom represent themselves um, not only with their Chinese roots, hang on a sec, sorry, okay, so, and they are an ethnic Chinese group, and on their website, that's where they start with their Chinese history, okay, but um, they also talk about their Iowa home. Okay. The Thai Dom come originally from the northwest part of North Vietnam. In 1952, many were evacuated from their homeland. Um, this was the Indo-Chinese War, remember? Um, beginning a 20-year journey through refugee camps in South Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand before they fled to Europe, Australia, and finally Iowa. 
Former Governor Robert Ray was behind a state initiative to accept this ethnic refugee group from the Vietnam War. 95% of Thai Dom in the U.S. live in Iowa, most of those in Des Moines. So here is Samba Kham, who is a good friend, um, who came when she was a child. And um, what she talks about is um, the ways in which she and her community are passing on their traditions to their kids. First of the Thai Dong refugees. I originally came from Laos, um, which is in Southeast Asia, right across from the Mekong River from Thailand. And I've been in the United States since October 27th, 1975. I was 11 years old when I came here. No matter where I came from or what my children were, they were born, they need to remember who they are, what their parents, you know, what product we are. So. That's when a group of us young people here in Des Moines has came together. And right now, currently, we are called the Thai Committee, that we are working towards um, a big vision is promoting tolerance of all people, regardless of your race, um, your sex, or whatever you are, whatever you say. We would want to promote that for our children to know that they are equal no matter who they are. And our other thing is to promote and preserve our Thai Dam heritage and tradition. And our group has been um, annually, we, we put together a New Year's celebration that we do with the, during the Chinese um, New Year in February, most of the time it's in. And we rent the tourism building, we invite the public, we just have the traditional food, the traditional clothing, the music, um, the traditional shows and dancing. And we just kind of basically left it at that for the past two years, but then this year we did something really special. We've decided, you know, yeah, we have our own tradition and heritage, but we want to draw more people so they would come and understand our culture. So what we did was invited different ethnic groups. Um, we had the Hmong dancers, the Lao dancers, the um, Vietnamese dancer, and next year I even have bigger plans as the president of the committee. I want to integrate into like maybe get the um, Sudanese. Um, refugees that's been here, the Bosnians, the Mexicans, you know. So I'm hoping to get more variety of different cultures besides Southeast Asians. And yeah, this is Thai Dom New Year. Young children ages from 5 to 12 to learn how to do traditional dances, dress in traditional clothes, and they would go to public schools to perform when asked or whatever, any reason. We've done them at the state fair, wherever anybody wants to ask, and we just feel that we want to let the public um, learn and be aware of, of the cultural diversity we have here in Des Moines. The Thai Dom people, they're all, um, their home original country is Vietnam. Actually, you know, Thai Dom people really, really never have a country to call home. They did have a Thai Iowa country. It was taken over by the Vietnamese. So ever since then, um, there's just a small group of people that they also have different, you know, like Thai Dom. The correct way to pronounce it is called Thai. It covers the black Thai Dom, the red Thai, the white, you know, there was all different, but we're all Thai. When the Vietnam War broke out in 1954, that's when um, the Thai Dam people migrated to Laos. Okay, they migrated to Laos and stayed there until 1975 when the communists started taking over after the Vietnam War, after the American troops pulled out. The Viet Cong started taking over the um, Laos. So that's when we migrated once again to Thailand. I remember my mom and my dad always gave us this little bag where we put our clothes in a bag and put it at the foot of our bed. So anything would break out, like if we hear bombs, because we had a bomb shelter, like big hole where they dig big holes that we're supposed to go grab the bags and go jump in and you know my parents always taught us how to hold hands and run together so we always had that there and what okay so that gives you one refugee's experience with that besides Thai Dom Iowa also re welcomed other Southeast Asians Lao Cambodians Hmong and Vietnamese and then when um, who was trained as a math teacher, has been a longtime coordinator of ESL for Des Moines Public Schools. And as an educator and cultural specialist, he's also a leader in the Des Moines Vietnamese community. And he's been instrumental in creating the Viet Vietnamese American Committee in Iowa, which is, goes by VASI, its initials, which along with several other organizations produced the annual TET, the Vietnamese New Year celebration in Des Moines. His thoughts about what TET means and how it encapsulates 
encapsulates his culture and identity, point out the deep-seated need people have to preserve their heritage, and especially, especially in a new world. And if you want um, some time, just Google uh, Vin Wynn and um, Iowa Roots, because there's also um, a, an amazing uh, interview with him talking about his refugee experience. He was a boat person. And I, I asked him at the time, I said, if you had known what you would be going through, would you do this? And he said, absolutely not. Uh, hang on. Folk Life Coordinator, Cliffords Council. Everybody is longing for that. Believe me, the Vietnamese want to go to that so they can meet their old friend, they can have time to begin to exchange something that they haven't had time to do. My name is Vinh Nguyen. I was born in Vietnam. I came to the state in 1983. That is uh, the greatest holiday, the biggest holiday for Vietnamese. Um, if you combine July 4, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year, and everything else you have, in the United States, it is dead for Vietnamese. Um, Vietnamese dead lasts from three days to many days. It depends on the region of Vietnam. Most likely in the city, we celebrate dead for three days. But in the countryside, that's the off season for them to harvest. Therefore, dead can be celebrated about two weeks to a month. We have to prepare quite a lot for that. When I was growing up, my mom uh, prepared Tet for a month ahead. Uh, she began to buy food and pickle different vegetables and different food and prepare some of the uh, very Vietnamese traditional food like bánh chín, bánh tét, and also to clean the houses. I mean, the house had to be spot clean. Um, they need, if it need a, a fresh paint of coat of paint, we need to do that. And when I was growing up, I remember at school, uh, that's the time that we also thank teacher. Um, we have celebration among ourselves and um, to say goodbye because that's our um, dead break. It lasted for months. And this is how the dead uh, begin. On the 23rd day of December, the family gathered together to send the kitchen god, uh, what we call a kitchen god, because the Vietnamese believe that there is an angel or god who stay in the kitchen, who knows everything about the family through the years. So on the 23rd of December, we sent that god back to the heaven so he can report to the king everything happened to our family or something that our family um, have to suffer throughout the years. Is that like Santa Claus? <laughs> anyway, um, clearly I could go on forever, but you would leave, as I said before. Um, but I could go on talking about and having you listen to the ways that refugees and immigrants who now make their home in Iowa find to express who they are. You're not going to hear any more interviews. Um, this is Du Algoni, who actually was a student in Iowa State, and he's new air or not in his language. Um, he can no longer hunt elephants, and that's what his interview talks about. Um, but he's earned a degree in business from ISU, and he tells his children about family still in Sudan. Sulfita Rizvich um, from Vladika Kladisha, near the Croatian border in the former Yugoslavia, now from Cedar Falls. Um, she was an elementary school teacher in her homeland. Um, she was also a folk dancer in a place where, as she says, dancers were ambassadors for their culture. And as an example of Iowa's crazy laws, as she has spent the last four years getting trained as a teacher, again, after 15 years of being a teacher. But she's a good one, <laughs> and we're glad she's staying here. So let me give you one final example. Oops, maybe not. Hang on. Okay, this is um, Ishmael Ayasiri, and he uses his music to remember and to perform his cultural traditions. So I'm gonna get this YouTube thing playing. 
And I'm gonna leave that one up there. This is an oud, which is like a lute. Okay, and it's an instrument that um, exists throughout the Middle East and obviously up into Europe. Okay, um, he's originally from Nasiriya, southeast of Baghdad, and he remembers hearing neighbors and family members sing traditional Iraqi country songs, though he himself preferred more urban music. Um, but in 1991, just after the first Gulf War, he and his family fled Iraq. He was actually a soldier um, in Hussein's army, and um, there was a death warrant out for him. After four years in a Saudi Arabian refugee camp, and, and think about your four years in college, imagine that time in a refugee camp. There's nothing to do. It's not a vacation. Um, it's poor. You get in line for food, and you get in line for clothes, and you get in line a lot. Anyway, after four years there, they came to Cedar Rapids. Um, and while in the refugee camp, he and his cousin, Salah and Haider, were able to study with the protege of Iraq's most revered oud maker, also in the refugee camp. An oud is similar to a lute, as I mentioned before. Unfortunately, even though he knows how to do so, Ishmael had neither the time nor the equipment to make ouds in the US. Playing was another matter, though, and in the early two. Uh, 2000s, um, early part of the century, Ishmael and his cousins formed a band which performed traditional and popular Iraqi music to great acclaim at the 2000 Iowa Cultural Language Conference in Des Moines and at the 2001 Festival of Iowa Folklife. The band dissolved and the Alia series moved on, still in the Cedar Rapids area. They were going to school, they were working, they were having their lives, and they still gathered with family members to eat traditional foods, play music, and sing songs for themselves. In April 2009, um, Ishmael got invited to perform for the Cedar Rapids Museum of Arts Middle Eastern Day. Notice that it used to be a Lebanese day um, celebrated by the Greek Orthodox Church, which is mostly run by the Lebanese who was, um, came to Iowa about 100 years ago. They were the largest, the first Lebanese group in the United States, by the way, in Iowa, another first. Um, Anyway, for various political reasons in town, this festival transformed itself into Middle Eastern Day. The church stopped doing it for other reasons. But the Museum of Art picked it up, which is kind of cool. Anyway, um, Ishmael got to perform. I got back in touch with him. And in August that year, we had him perform at the Midwest Folklife Festival, a tri-state event in Bishop Hill, Illinois. Because he's received such affirmation and recognition for Sood music, which is not just Iraqi, but with ties to Arabic music throughout the Middle East, and, and here's where you might want to think of transnational, regional kinds of ethnic identity. Um, he's gotten more serious about his playing, and he recently received an Arts Council Folk and Traditional Arts grant to go back to Iraq to study with a master oud player there, and I think he's leaving in another week. Um, the musician in Iraq, and I'm not going to use his name, um, Ishmael told me doesn't want to publicize that he's teaching. To do so is not politically safe right now. And were it known that he was teaching an American Iraqi, he could be killed. So. What's interesting about this is, is that, and this has happened with other groups, that a tradition may be, get preserved over here, and once things, if they ever settle down over there, it can maybe go back there. We don't know. So clearly not all instances of cultures coming together are positive ones. Issues of illegal immigrants, English language learning, funding enough teachers and social workers, or different traditions of disciplining children and sometimes spouses are all areas of conflict. Different religious beliefs, food prohibitions, notions about time, the importance of family and community versus the pressures of the workplace, attitudes about modern medical procedures versus traditional remedies. These are all issues that have been faced before. In addition to day-to-day -day help, newcomers also encounter prejudice, hate, and to their way of thinking, irrational laws and rules that just make no sense. Storm Lake, Marshalltown, and Postville, as well as Dubuque, Des Moines, Perry, West Liberty, and Waterloo, among many Iowa towns and cities, have been targeted for their difficulties and rarely for their successes. Fear of the unknown is common to old and new residents. But if we use these differences or conflicts as opportunities to learn, however, we often find that these new or different ways of doing things enriches rather than diminishes our lives. So in conclusion, without really concluding a lot, um, I would urge you to explore the ways that different individuals and communities preserve and perform their cultural traditions and do it person to person. The, I think the most rewarding experience you might have is when you ask someone from a culture not yours to tell you about his or her music, dance, food, or beliefs. The lines of difference blur when you share and make the time and space for the connections to happen. Thanks. So I think this is the, if you have questions, if you're still awake, 
It's your turn. And thank you, by the way, to Denny, who made this work. <laughs> and to Sandra and to Joe. No, the State Historical Society does. Um, because the Folk Life Program lives in the Iowa Arts Council, um, and because the emphasis very much is on living traditions, um, I don't focus on historical stuff unless it's still around. So the Amana colonies, that's why I started with them, because they're a great example, as, as are the, well, the Meskwaki and the Taidum of cultures that look back, but also very much are looking forward and are always negotiating who they are. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I know. He, yeah, he passed away. Um, yeah, he, he was a barbecue guy in town with uh, great barbecue. And he was from Texas, and I went to grad school in Texas. So when I found out about him, uh, Kurt Snook turned me on to him. He said, you got to go interview George. And it was like, oh, it's barbecue brisket. So that was, that was kind of fun. Well, they're, they're doing it without anybody else's help, of course. Um, it, there is help, of course. I mean, it's happening in the churches. There's a Catholic church and these in the evangelical church. There's several restaurants. There's a couple food markets. There's at least one bakery. Actually, I was there last week on the way back from where I was coming back from. Um, so it's happening. Now, there is apparently a July 4th celebration that the town does that is a multicultural a celebration. From what I've heard, there are no Latinos on the board, on the planning board of this. And it, again, if you're trying to be, excuse me, this is my Iowa Arts Council hat. Um, if you're trying to work to present other people's cultures, I, I think it really behooves you to work with those people and um, have them be a part of your group. And if your language isn't their, your langu their language and saying your doors are open, I mean, this is kind of an accessibility speech I give a lot. Um, no, your doors are not open. Get your flyers out there in Spanish. Make sure your facilities are ramped and that you have all kinds of accessibility stuff going on. Um, you know, so so I'm not actually real clear what's going on um, in terms of the packing plant, which may be what you're asking. Um, that particular plant, we did research there years ago for actually a project that the name of this talk came from, the Iowa Traditions in Transition, looking at new refugees and immigrants, what they're doing to preserve who they are or um, you know, how they're doing it. And Marshalltown was one of the examples. And at that point, this was about, I want to say 10 years ago, um, the middle management at that packing plant were all just afraid to speak about anything. Um, they didn't want to be recorded. I mean, this is not uncommon. Um, you know, their jobs are certainly at stake. I mean, it's, it's not the same kind of situation now that it was 10 years ago, I think. Um, but I don't know the details. So I know that there's been vigils, you know, uh, about the Postville raid. Um, you know, there's uh, various plays, docudramas that are coming out of it. I think, I don't know, are you working, is Mary, Mary are you working with some of the Marshalltown folks on your, your next thing? Um, so I don't really know. We're right now we're doing a um, a comprehensive folk life field survey of the state. We started. We haven't done this since the sesquicentennial. I did refugees and immigrants about ten years ago, and you know you've seen all the the products that come out of it. Um, sesquicentennial work was done in ninety five ninety six. Um, so we're really do we have NEA funding to do this? So we started with Western Iowa. We're now doing North Central Iowa. Next up, if we get the money, we'll be South Central. We decided to work with the underserved parts of the state and work our way east. Um, so we'll be finding out maybe more about Marshalltown next year. Yeah, Zora.
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go back to the Amana colonies. I think they're an easy example um, because they've some have thought through some of the issues, and and it's clearly commercialized. I mean, there is no question that the out layer, the outside layer, the highway road stuff. I mean, you want to do drive by Amana, that's it. Um, and and literally, um, and John Andel Andelson has done a lot of work on this. He teaches at Grinnell, um, and Steve Orne, who used to be the state folklorist, uh, wrote a book about the Amanas uh, called Remaining Faithful, um, and. You know, so there is that, you know, junk on the highway. And I made the mistake of, you can't quote me on this, although now I'm going to be recorded. I ate at one of the restaurants, and it, it was it was not good. Um, the restaurants inside, you know, when you get into Maine Amana are better. Um, and if you ask the locals, they'll, they will steer you to the right places. But there was a thing that was going on, I want to say not this, it might have happened this summer, I don't know. It definitely happened last summer. They started doing at the restaurants on Wednesday evenings communal suppers. And somebody told me about this, and I had interviewed a bunch of the winery folks there for this place-based food project I did with the Leopold Center some years ago. So they were telling me about this, and the art skilled people were, were telling me, I mean, they, these are the people who preserve the culture. And, and I said, well, gosh, where's the PR on this? Oh, we, we didn't do any PR. People just know about it. And I said, well, how are they going to know about it? Well, they would just know. And I said, OK. If you now, now they're competing with the casinos, according to the folks in the Amana colonies. You know, the CBB people, Convention of Visitors Bureau, have done all kinds of studies. Casinos are taking money away from cultural attractions. They're, they're, they know this deep in their souls. They've got the numbers to prove it. Now, here was a great example. I mean, it's food for heaven's sakes. You can attract almost anybody with food, and to advertise. You know, you don't have to pay. You know, get in line for this special. You know, once a year communal dinner in November. That if you don't know about, it, believe me, you don't know about it. It's hard to find it on their website. I only know about it because people have told me about it, and they expect me to come every couple of years. Um, and I said, advertise this. Well, well, we'll think about it. So you know, at the same time, they're saying, yeah, we got to do this. The same, very same ones are not doing it. So you know, they live with the tension. You know, I mean, the, the classes are advertised from the Arts Guild. You and I can go take a basket class. We could take a knitting class. Um, but, you know, if you don't know to look for it, you wouldn't know, you know. So, yeah, and so there, the Thai Village, There's it's now Thai Village, Inc., and they have this little, I don't know if you've been there yet, Mary, they're, they're in the uh, sort of north side of Des Moines. Um, right now they just have a pavilion. They have plants. Excuse me. I mean, if they want it to be their cultural center, they've had an archives. Excuse me, in somebody's church basement forever, and um, you know, I, I have every every confidence that they will make it happen. They've made amazing things happen. It's it's for all the ins and outs of that community. And there's five, uh, what would you call them? Five societies within, and they fight with each other. And there's gender fights, and there's age fights, and. The fact that they've pulled off in the last couple of years a joint Thai Dom New Year is is kind of a miracle. But you know, people are getting older, and the older ones know that if they don't pass it on, it's not going to happen. Um, and they seem to have pulled together in this last couple of years more than than I actually thought they would, knowing the fighting that goes on in the Jewish community in Des Moines, where some of us aren't talking to others of us right now, um, and probably won't for a couple more years. So, you know, I think all groups, to wander back to your question, you know, have this outside face. You know, if you come to the Jewish Food Festival at my temple, B'nai Yashurn, in Des Moines, you're not going to get the dirty laundry. You're going to get a tour. You're going to get the food. Um, it may not be the food I'd make in my house or that my grandmother made, but heck, I'm not from Des Moines. So, you know, it's a little different here. But, but you're not going to hear the bad stuff because you're a visitor. And you don't get the inside scoop until you hang out. And um, you know, I, I think again, they're they're all trying to balance this. I think that the Dutch towns are probably the best and the worst of it because they are so commercial. I mean, I I I, I don't like crowds, so I really have not been to the to the Tulip Festival in Pella or in Orange City. Um, and the thought of people in 19th century Dutch dress pushing brooms along just absolutely horrifies me as a folklorist. But, you know, it's their community, it's their celebration, and when you hang out there a little, um, yeah, you find out what is more or less real or not, 
And, um, you know, it, I think a lot of groups do tend to protect their core, um, not always consciously, but I, I think it's sort of a real gut level thing that if they can, that's what they're going to, if they want to survive, they have to. Yeah, and you know, at the same time, they're going to you know the Dutch Lutheran Reformed Church, which is a pretty serious church as churches go. Um, you know, they're not what a friend of mine and uh, the Danish have the Happy Danes and the Holy Danes. They are not the happy people. Um, you know, it's a very serious service, and and I I love that they conclude their event, and and Arn City and Pella both do this with a with a worship service. You know, the, and the, and they're saying, you know, you or I might not go to it. I might. I want to hear the music um, or see what's going on with it. But the, you know, the average member of the public, if you're visiting and you want to go to the Tulip Festival, you're not going to go to the church service. It's just you know, probably not part of what you're going to do. Um, but for the community, they're still saying, this is ours, and this is who we are. And, and I, again, I think you have to you know, pay attention to the, the stuff between the cracks. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you at the uh, Five Village uh, Oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'd say like, all of the above. Um, I mean, one of the things um, that that I've always been amazed and pleased about was how how welcoming um, the various groups in the Southeast Asian community in Iowa are. Now, Iowa, none of our populations are particularly big. I mean, we're still over ninety percent white. Now, there's a lot of white ethnic, which you know I've been talking about, um, but the result with groups whose native language is even after you know many generations, is is not English. Um, is it is it you know for again for me as a folklorist, it's it's great because cultures are pretty permeable. I can walk in with my folklorist hat. I'm as shy as anybody else just walking in to a place where I'm not familiar, um, and and I'm welcomed. Now I have to tell you, with having my daughter with me, and I started working with the Southeast Asians long before you know Eva was was around. She's ten and a half. I walk in with her. Oh, you know. I get anything I want, um, and and you know she likes it. I mean she's a folklorist kid, and I have a, you know a lot of colleagues you know whose whose kids have been to festivals, have been dragged everywhere. I mean she was at her first performances when she was seven months old. Um, she's been passed around among many folklorists, um, and uh, but if I have her with me, the women tell me more, you know. So so there's that. Um, and if I have her with me now, I, I will tell you that any Cambodian knows she's Cambodian. She has a classic profile. I mean, she looks like the thousand-year-old carvings. I go to the Lao community, and the Lao, the Thai, and the Cambodians are basically the same ethnic group, give or take, you know, whichever other group has been trumping through. Um, and if I go to Lao events and I'm not with the people who I know, they, they look at me, they look at her, and they kind of say... Is she half? Because she's got dark curly hair. And she's thin, and we both have long arms and legs. And she looks nothing like me. Now, she has a number of my gestures, which, you know, is sort of amusing to watch. But, you know, anybody who's got kids has seen that. You know, you see yourself in miniature, which is odd. Um, but, you know, she, she does create an entree 
into the Southeast Asian communities that I wouldn't have. I mean, I'm one of the moms who brings her to dancing, you know, every week for two months. So what else are we going to do? We're going to hang out and talk to each other. You know, so I've found out actually lots more um, since she's been on the scene. But going to the events, um, I would say, you know, really, the Thai Dom especially have made it so that anybody's welcome. And because so many of their sponsor families come to the events as well, they continue to invite them. I mean, these are close, close relationships. And Joe and I were talking about this before the talk started. The, the refugee resettlement system used to be linked tightly to sponsor families and to churches, synagogues, you know, mosques, temples, whatever. Um, it's not any longer. And I, I don't understand how people are surviving. Um, I mean, I, I remember an experience I had when I did my field work for my dissertation in London. The people I was staying with were away. Now, this is London, you know, okay? I speak the language. I couldn't figure out how the stove worked. There's these gas marks, and I'm like, does it light? Is there a pilot? What? I can't cook, you know? The light switches are different, um, you know, and I speak the language, or I thought I did, you know, and so I don't understand how actually how people are getting through the day that come from other cultures it, it, these days because they don't have those sponsor families. Um, you know, I think the Lao stuff is more in group. They have been, I'd say, probably the most successful at maintaining and promoting and preserving their culture. They have the Lao not to see dancers and musicians. Now, the, the Lao came. A lot of them came as refugees. Oh, several of them actually were students at Iowa State um, before the war you know, ended. And so they have a relationship uh, kind of by accident with Iowa. Um, and so there's a refugee community. There's an immigrant slash, and a refugee community as well. But the, the Lao Natasin dancers and musicians, w which the, we we're talking like the National Ballet, okay? Iowa and California were courting them. Iowa won, you know. They were brought over on NEA money. They toured for a few years. And then, you know, life had to happen. They weren't making it as musicians and dancers. Not, not many do in this country, as we know. Um, but in, in, I would say, probably in the last 10 years, I mean, partly because I'm just fascinated by them, and um, because, admittedly, Lao traditional dance and classical dance is very close to Cambodian, so I you know, kind of have a little bit of a personal interest in it, too. And my daughter's a dancer. So we spend a fair amount of time with them, and we got to bring them to Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago as part of a program from the Library of Congress. Um, so each state and each state's folklorist got to do this. It's, it, was, it was quite wonderful. Um, you know, they didn't know how the Metro worked. Uh, the, ki the kids were great. You know, the, the adults were a little bit freaking out over the whole experience, and at one point we, they got lost, and it, it wasn't good. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, everybody ended up having a good time. Um, with it, there were moments when they told me at the last minute that, well, should they carry the swords on the plane or put them in their checked luggage? This was two days before they left, and, and I was like, what swords? And they said, you know, for the sword dance. And I'm like, let me call the Library of Congress. I'll, I'll find out for you. I said, no, do not carry them on the plane. I'll tell you that right now. Well, it turned out they couldn't even carry them into, they, they, the real issue was carrying them into the Library of Congress because this was post 9-11. You know, these are weapons. So anyway. So I would say, again, um, the, the Lao yeah, are kind of in the middle, I'd say. The Cambodians are, gosh, I'd say probably the most existentialist of all the Southeast Asians. It either works or it doesn't, and nobody's going to get too wound up about it because, really, life's been a lot worse. Um, you know, so the, when they got into their new building that Jean was talking about, the roof was leaking, the kids had to dance not in one place because the roof was leaking and it hadn't been finished yet and the cement's kind of patchy in places. But, hey, it was New Year's, so they're doing their thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, knock on a door, they're your friend for life. So um, I would say probably the Hmong are the most difficult, at least I have found, to get into. Again, I can go to the New Year celebrations. You know, Mary and I have been, I've known people for years who are at the Des Moines Farmer's Market. They used to run a restaurant that I used to go to, great Thai restaurant. Um, and, um, but I haven't actually interviewed the ladies that, that Mary is now interviewing. The person, turns out, and I didn't even realize she was uh, their cousin, um, who made the, uh, no, she's not the one. There's somebody else who, who made the, um, the skirt that's floating around somewhere. Um, hopefully it hasn't walked off. But um, 
I don't know. They're, they're somehow, and, and when you do the reading and the research about the Hmong community, they are far more insular than I think almost any other Southeast Asian group, and, and I think for, for good reason. Um, you know, if you read the book, um, The Spirit Lifts You Up and You Fall Down, it's, it's one of the most profound uh, exposés of how cultures can't make it work together. Um, you know, but, but it, you know, such different belief systems, such different ways of just thinking, getting through the day. And yet, you know, they're doing fine. They have most of the, um, the fruit and vegetable stands that are Asian at the Des Moines Farmer's Market. I don't think any other group is selling. Um, so, I don't know, sorry, it's sort of a, a, an odd answer. It, it's a mix, I would say. I think all the organizations, you know, all the, all the, the ones that have the temples, the Buddhist temples, um, are relatively together. And, um, but, you know, what's interesting now, um, people just a little bit younger than me, um, they have what are called mixed marriages. We have Vietnamese Thai Dom couples. You know, uh, their kids are dancing in both things. Um, I would say mostly people are going to go with their mom's tradition, but not totally. So for, you know, Vin and Vilai Nguyen, she's Thai Dom, he's Vietnamese. You heard him speak a little about Tet. His kids do both. And he's really clear that they're going to do both. Um, he's a very involved father. So anyway. family. Yeah, I mean, my kid, I mean, people ask me, you know, if, if Eva speaks Khmer, and I said, no, I don't speak it. I mean, I think, you know, we learned about 10 words. And it, you know, we do a lot um, to connect her with her heritage, with her Cambodian heritage. But, you know, she's also Jewish, and she's American, and she's Iowan, and she says things like pop and suckers, which, okay, you guys think that's normal, right? Okay, it's not normal for me. I didn't grow up with those words. <laughs> you know, she's an Iowan, very clearly. Um, and she's Cambodian, and she's Jewish, you know. So when we were in Cambodia last year, I mean, the kids thought it was just hysterical that she couldn't speak. You know, they didn't understand. Why can't she talk to us? And I said, well, she, you know, can't she talk? I said, yeah, she can, she can talk, but not your language, <laughs> you know. But you look at her, and, you know, so, you know, that's, you know, I think that's a whole other issue for those of us with kids from other countries. Um, and from different ethnic groups is, um, you know, as this country changes and the face of our, the faces of our country change, um, you know, the encounters, I hope, will be different. You know, so. But yeah, I, I mean, part of the deal also, I mean, I have to deal to some degree with some of the conflict and some of the negatives, but I work for a public agency and Number one, there's certain things people tell me that I will not put in any kind of public document. I think it's inappropriate. Um, Jonathan Buffalo at Meskwaki Settlement told me some stories about dating that and I said, oh, could I record those? And I, I knew he was going to say no when he looked at me. He said, no, you know, because he was telling me about, be, telling about being a young man and what young men do. And, um, you know, and, and, and it was really interesting from, you know, different Indian ethnicities perspective, and, and he gave a great description of, well, you know, this tribe, you know, the women act this way, and this tribe they act this way, and this tribe they act this way, and it was, it was just a wonderful 
ethnographic summary. And, and I, that's actually what I wanted to get on tape. And he was, no, no, not going to happen. So, you know, so there's that part. Or, you know, if I were to be in Postville or Marshalltown or places where there are Dubuque, where, where conflicts have been horrendous, um, you know, I just wouldn't do it um, be, because what I do becomes part of the public record. So I do have to be careful. And so it's a, it's a different hat than working at a university and getting to do my research. Um, you know, and, and so consequently, you know, when we had these units on different cultures for the, the second folk life curriculum, each one deals to a degree with the wars that have been part of why various groups are here. But it's a paragraph or two. And I give other information if, if older kids or college students or teachers want to dive deeper, they can. But the basic stuff is not going to deal overtly with too much conflict. And as we were saying earlier, um, you know, festivals, public displays, they're not about washing our dirty linen in public. They are about the positive. Um, the dysfunction comes out. You don't have to look for it. It, it happens. Any other questions? Gene, yeah. Yeah, I went to Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. Both. I keep getting emails from both of them, so something's clearly happening. I I did just hear that the Czech and Slovak Museum is going to rebuild, and they're going to rebuild in the Czech village, um, so they're quite committed to it. Um, and and you know, it makes sense. It's where they're from. I mean, I I don't know what's going to happen in terms of you know the the protections for the flood control and how they're going to get around those issues. I mean, they're in the valley. It's it's going to flood again, unless you know various practices stop and I don't I'm not optimistic about that um, but you know the groups you know they've been there for the the Czech and Slovaks for over a hundred years they're not going anywhere um, you know so I, I don't I know that they got some grants we had National Endowment for the Arts funding for um, emergency flood relief that went to a lot of artists and organizations in eastern Iowa um, and I know that I know that the Czech and Slovak Museum. I think they got some of the money. I know some individual artists got got funding. Um, you know, Waterloo got hit as well, um, not as profoundly and totally as Cedar Rapids did. Um, you know, in terms of the African American Museum, I have to say I really don't know. Um, we. The guy that was director of the museum is now at the Fort Des Moines Museum. So the the main contact I had, the conduit, is has changed. So, um, and and because their focus tends to be on history, I don't deal with them that much. Um, so, that's yeah. I mean, there there may be more information on our website about that in the in the links section, but I I don't know. Thank you all. <laughs>